If you have your Bibles, we're going to be in Acts chapter 9. Acts chapter 9. This morning I want to talk to you for a few moments about how to know the will of God. How, how to know the will of God. I know for, you know, there's people that, you know, like, you know, overly spiritualize this and, you know, say that they got to go off into some area, you know, when utter quiet for like three, four weeks to find out what the will of God is and to do all these things. But I personally don't see that in the Bible. I don't see that, you know, in, in Scripture, I don't, I don't see that also where somebody says, well, I have to go do this and this and this and this, you know, and uh, all these things in order for that to happen. But in Acts chapter 9, verses 1 through 6, we're going to see a man that God tells him, the, you know, the will for him. In Acts chapter 9, verses 1 through 6, it says this. The Bible reads, And Saul, uh, yet breathing out threatenings and slaughter against the disciples of the Lord, went unto the high priest. For, uh, I'm going to pause here for a moment. Saul is also Paul, who wrote the majority of the New Testament. So uh, just so you know that, just so you have you know, that idea that this man was not, always, you know, was not always the nice guy that we see in, in Scripture as far as writing the Bible. This is before he gets saved, okay? So verse 2, and desired, of him, uh, and desired of him to Damascus, to the synagogues, that if uh, he found any of this way, which is speaking of Christianity, by the way, whether they were men or women, he might bring them bound unto Jerusalem. And as, he, and as he journeyed, he came near Damascus, and suddenly there shined around about him a light from heaven. And he fell to the, uh, to the earth and heard a voice saying unto him, Saul, Saul, why, perse- uh, why persecutest thou me? And he said, Who art thou, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus whom thou persecutest. It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. Verse 6, And he, trembling and astonished, said, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? And the Lord said unto him, Arise and go into the city, and it shall be told thee what thou must do. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for your word. Lord, I thank you that you want us to know the will of God. Uh, the will of God, you know, your will for our lives. You don't want to hide it. You don't want to keep it under a bushel or anything else, but you want to reveal it to us. You want uh, us to be about what you would have us to be doing. And so, Lord, I pray that this morning that you would fill me with your spirit, that you would give us ears to hear your word, and, like, uh, Lord, that we not just be hearers, but we also be doer, doers of your word as well. And, Lord, may your word be as a fire shut up in my bones. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, Think about this. If you were ever to have a, a face-to-face encounter with the Lord Jesus, uh, the Lord Jesus, could you ask? Uh, and you could ask him any. Uh, you can ask him a question, any question that you wanted, right? What would that question be? This is not like the genie. We're not you know, asking for three wishes. I'm saying like, what if you could ask the Lord one thing, any question? What would it be? Now, I suppose, you know, for some of us, we'd have to think long and hard about, you know, about what to ask him. But I'm guessing that many in here would ask, what would you have me to do? This is what Saul asks him, you know. Uh, this is what Saul is asking him at this moment you know, on the Damascus Road experience. And that experience did happen to the man, you know, like I said, in, uh, that we just read about. He asked that very question, and uh, he also received a response from the Lord. What did the Lord tell him in verse 6? The Lord told him, he said, he said, arise and go into the city, and it shall be told there what thou must do. And you say, well, that's not the will of God. Well, God's beginning to reveal, you know, his will, you know, to him as he goes. In this passage, Saul, that's his Jewish name. Paul is his Greek name. He goes by Paul because why? Because the vast majority of the time that uh, after this experience, he's speaking to the Greeks. He, he goes and he, he back and forth and he talks to the Jews but oftentimes he faces opposition from the Jews. And so he goes to the Greeks, you know, those, you know, or the Gentiles, if you will, um, those that are non-Jewish, because he also does speak to those that are not Greek. But uh, so he goes and talks to the Gentiles. Why? Because they're receiving the gospel. Every time that, that Paul begins to talk to, to, uh, to the Jewish people at that time, they begin to do what? They begin to persecute them. They begin you know, to want to try and kill them. They want, begin to want to do all these things. And it's kind of you know, a little bit ironic because that's what Paul was doing. It says at the beginning of this that Paul says what? Yet breathing out threatenings and slaughter unto, uh, against the disciples of the Lord, what is he doing? 
He's doing the same thing that they're doing to him, that they're going to be doing to him. Why? Because he gets saved, and they want to stop whatever Jesus Christ, you know, whatever God wants to do in his life, all right? So, but here's the thing is, there's two questions that, you know, that are asked in here, and we, uh, we all need to answer this question. Number one is this, what, uh, you know, what, I'm oh, sorry, who art thou, Lord, or who are you, Lord? What does he come back and say? He says, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest, right? This is the single most important question in all of life. Who is Jesus Christ to you? Who is Jesus Christ to you? Your answer determines where you will spend eternity. You have to answer that question for yourself. Number two is this. Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? In other words, what do you want me to do? What is your will for my life? This is the second most important question in life because God's will and his will alone should be the heart's desire of every child of God. Everyone, you know, every child, every believer should want to know what the will of God is for their life. So what is it? You know, the, obviously the context, Paul was told to go into the city, uh, into the city, and there he would be told what to do. God did not hide his will from Paul. As soon as he asked him, what, you know, what do you want me to do? He, he said, you know, go here. And you'll find out. And he, like I said, he didn't hide it, and he's not going to hide it from you. Most people think that you got to be some super spiritual person or anything else, or you got to be a pastor, or you got to do this, or you got to have this Damascus Road experience in order to know what the will of God is for your life. This morning, like I said, I want you, to, uh, I want to preach to you for a few moments on how to know the will of God. But now, before, we, uh, you know, before you can know the will of God, you, have to understand, you must understand of how his will operates. There are three ways in which we may understand the will of God. Number one is this, God's sovereign will. God's sovereign will. This, this, is, a, uh, this is a decision of God that is always carried out. Nothing in the universe is ever able to stop it. God is God, and he accomplished what he wishes, God's sovereign will is mysterious and is only known to God. How is this shown in the Bible? The Bible says before the foundations of the earth, what? That he was going to die for us on the cross. There was nothing that was going to stop that. Satan was going to try to and everybody else was going to try to, but there was nothing that could stop him for dying for your sins. There was nothing that could stop him. Number two, God's moral will. This too is forever settled in, uh, in his and is unchanging. God's moral will does not change. Morality does not change to God. Even though that people, you know, you'll have people out there that say, well, you know what, that was okay. I mean, you're so old-fashioned. You're so, you know, this, this, and this. That was so, you know, whatever. And they'll go out there and, you know, just, you know, all different kinds of things. Like, my wife and I, here's the thing. Like, we didn't kiss until we knew that we were going to get married. That is so old-fashioned. But then you have our people going around, and they, you know what? They're going around just like whoever they're with. They're like, you know, they're kissing, doing whatever, and all sorts of you know, bad things. And then they come out there, and they say they have all these regrets in life. After I got saved, she was the only woman that I ever kissed. The only one. You say, well, you kissed your daughter. You know what I'm talking about. That's so old-fashioned. No, it's not. Because think about all the ones out there that, have, you know, that sit there and wish. They go, man, I wish I, I, I never had done that. I wish I would never done this. I wish I would have never been with that person. I wish I would have never kissed. And all that kind of stuff. God's will, like I say, God's moral will. This is not about you know, kissing and dating and all that kind of stuff. But the fact is, is that God's moral will is forever settled. It is unchanging. Some things are right and some things are wrong right? It does not matter what society tells you. The moral will, uh, this moral will is revealed in the word of God and the conscience of man. There's a reason why, uh, you know, that people will, that maybe have never been to church, know a little bit of right and wrong. Why? Because the Bible says that he has written the word upon their hearts. They know a little bit of right and wrong. Whether or not they want to follow that, that's a whole other story. 
But there, is th- there are some things that are right and some things that are wrong. And number three is God's particular will, in which that's what we're going to be focusing on this morning. He has a will that is per- uh, particular and uh, peculiar to your life. Look at verses uh, 15 and 16 of Acts chapter uh, 9. But the Lord said unto him, Go thy way, for he is a chosen vessel unto me to bear my name be, uh, before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. For I will show him uh, how great things he must suffer for my namesake. God tells him the will for his life. This is not uh, everybody's will for their life. I, before I go a little bit further, some people are going to go, I don't think I want to do that. I don't think I want to know God's will because right there it says that he's going to show him how great of a suffering that he must, you know, that he must take, you know, partake in for his namesake. Well, Paul was, I mean, go read 1 Corinthians, I believe it's uh, 9, or 9 or 10, where it talks about all the things that Paul went through, where he was beaten, where he was left out, you know, out in the ocean, you know, uh, left for dead, where he was flogged, you know, uh, you know, 39 times, three times. I mean, all the things that he went through, why? Because that's what God's will for, you know, for his life was. And you're going, man, this is not an encouraging message so far. But the thing is, is that this particular uh, will, it's going to, it will vary from saint to saint. I can, uh, I can see all three aspects of God's will in my, in my life. I can see how God's will has worked in my life over and over. His sovereign will, his sovereign will for, uh, you know, for me and for you is that his love is set upon me and it saved me. His sovereign will was, you know what, you're going to get saved. His moral will was that I would stop cursing, drinking, and all that. He's like, you know what, I don't want you to be doing that anymore. That's what his, his moral will says. And it was, his, uh, it was and is his uh, peculiar will for my li- or particular will for my life that I became a preacher of the gospel. It varies from person to person. But you'll see all three of these aspects in your life. Even though that you and I are such a small, a, small, a small part of God's vast creation and our, uh, and our lives seem insignificant, God knows you. Did you know that? God knows you by name, and he loves you. Just because, you know, obviously there's God's vast creation, and you see, uh, you know, like, in our lives, like I said, seem to us to be very insignificant, there's a reason why he died for you. It's because... He, want, he, he wants to know you, or he knows you, and he loves you. Even the very head, uh, hairs of, uh, of your head are numbered and known by him. He knows how much hair you have on your head, however much or however little you have. And I say that because I know. As a result, he has designed a particular will for your life and has promised to reveal it to you and to guide you into it. God doesn't want, want you to go around with, what is, what is the will of God for my life? What is the will of God for my life? Now, the sad reality is that there's a lot of people asking that question, but because, you know, the reason why that they don't know what it is or it's hard for them, and I'm not, I'm not making any blanket statement in here, but I'm saying at other churches where they preach the, the false gospel of repent of all your sins and all that stuff and attach that to salvation and say, well, you've got to repent all your, of all your sins to be saved. You have to... Uh, be baptized in water, be saved. You have to do, all, I mean, and they have add this laundry list of all these things, all these requirements, and they'll say, oh yeah, but it's by faith alone too. All that. The reason why those people are saying, what is God's will for my life is, is because they're not saved. Because that's a false gospel. You can't get into heaven by repenting of all your sins. You can't get into heaven by being water baptized. You can't get into heaven by all those things. The way that you get into heaven is how? It's faith alone in Jesus Christ, that what he did on the cross is enough to save you. That's how you know. That is salvation. Now, after salvation, then you go on and to, you, you want to go to church and you want to uh, be water baptized and you want to do all those things. But as you're obedient to the Lord, and we're going to see, you'll see here in a moment, that's the, you know, uh, where you're going to begin to see God's will in your life unfold. But you've got to be saved first. It can't be through a false gospel. Before I get into how to know the will of God, and you say, well, Pastor, you, you just keep on pushing it back, pushing it back. Yep. I, I first want to address some of those myths and fables, those untruths concerning the will of God. First, first myth is this, that God will give you a roadmap. God doesn't give you a roadmap. God doesn't give you a roadmap. There's a reason why the Bible says that we walk by faith and not by sight. He gives us relationships. 
as you follow him, he will reveal his will, he will reveal his will unto you. He's going to, as you go, as you follow him, all those things, he is going to reveal it as you go. Like I said, we walk by faith, not by sight. Or as we see in Exodus chapter 13, verse 21, it says, And the Lord went before them by, uh, by day in a, a pillar of a, of a cloud to lead them the way, and by night in a pillar of fire to give them light to go by day and night. And you say, well, that would be awesome. If I can get a pillar of cloud and a pillar of fire to show me which way to go, that would be great. No, like I say, we walk by faith and not by sight. It's the same thing. God reveals, you know, sometimes it's step by step as you go, but you have to be willing to do it. So many of us want to say, God, I want to know, I want to see the end before I ask you, you know, what your will is. And that's a dangerous thing, you know, to even ask. But the thing is, is that if God were to show you the, you know, the will for your life all the way at the end, you probably want to want to start it because you're like, I have no idea how to get there. That's why he doesn't reveal it all the way to you totally and completely. He says step by step as you go. Number two, uh, the second myth is this. God doesn't want you to have any fun. That's a myth. God is not some cosmic killjoy. If you surrender to his will, you, uh, you, uh, you know, uh, a lot of people think that if you surrender to his will, you will have a hard and unhappy life. And many are afraid to find his will because they are afraid of what they may be asked to do. That's often, you know, like I said, if God showed you everything all the way at the end, you wouldn't want to do it. Or you would say, you know what, I don't even know how to do it. That's why he says step by step. And I can guarantee by the time you come to the end of your life, you're like, man, how did I start, over, how did I start back here and get up here? God guided you every single step of the way. Now, what we need to realize is we need to put ourselves, you know, for a moment, put yourself in the place of God. How do you treat your children? Isn't he better than us? Isn't God going to treat, uh, uh, isn't God going to treat us better and we are his kids, right? He's going to treat us better than we treat our own kids and we love our kids, right? Luke chapter 11, verse 11 through 13 says this, if a, if a son shall ask bread of, you, uh, of any of you that is a father, Will he give uh, some a stone? Or if he ask a fish, will he, uh, or will he for a fish give him a serpent? Or if, uh, or if he uh, shall ask uh, an egg, will he offer him a, a scorpion? If ye then, being evil, uh, know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to them that ask him? God is not going to give you something else when you ask him for, you know, say, God, I want to know the, you know, the will of God for my life. He's not going to say, okay, how about I give you a shiny new rock? Or how about I do this or this? No, he's going to give you what you ask for. He's, that's how God, you know, will treat us. Number three is this. God, you know, the third myth is this. God only speaks to certain and a few holy people. That is a myth. That is a lie. That is an untruth. God's will is not limited to those who, you know, those with a position. He doesn't, he just doesn't speak to the Pauls and the Peters and the Isaiahs. He has a will for every saint at every conceivable level of commitment. Is God going to ask my daughter to do something that God asked me to do? No. Because it's on every single level of commitment. God's going to ask my wife to do something different than she asked me or that God asked Antonio to do. It's on every, everybody's on a different level of commitment, you know, and where they're at. And God knows what you can do and what you can't do. And God knows, he says, you know what, I'm going to stretch your faith, and I'm going to ask you to do something that you can do, but you don't think that you can do. He's not going to make you do something that, you, that he knows that you could never do. Why? Because it's going to discourage you, and you're going to say, I don't want to know the will of God, I can't even do it anymore. But he will stretch you. He has a, a, a if, if you choose to follow his will, Here's the thing, you will lead a holier life. And you know what? He calls you where you're at. He calls you right where you're at. He doesn't sit there and say, well, as soon as you get to level, you know, you know, 50, you're on level 5 right now. As soon as you get to level 50, I'll start having a will for your life. No, he calls you where you're at. And he works with you where you're at. He knows where, you know, he knows where he's taking you. 
He knows where he's taking you. The fourth, the fourth myth is this. By the way, there are six of these that I have on here, but there are probably more than that. You have to wait on a Damascus Road experience. That's myth number four. Oftentimes, like I said, people have this idea that they read about Paul or they, you know, whatever, and, and I've shared this before, where somebody will go to a service where there's like drug addicts and alcoholics and all sorts of stuff, and they're like, I want God to just bam, like that, and I'll, you know, just knock right off of my, my bar stool. And I'll also, and, and God doesn't work that way all the time. People want to, you know, have their life all in shambles before, you know, all of a sudden, you know, they're like, boom, God knocked me down, and I had this rage. No, you don't have to do that. Why, why, why be dumb? Why be stupid? Why go out there and do all this stuff and say, you know what? Uh, you know, I'm doing this so that way God will give me an awesome testimony. So that way I can find out God's will for my life. You don't have, don't be stupid. <laughs> I can't say it any plainer than that. Are you guys waiting for me to actually like, you know, say what's on my mind? You know that I just, you know, I just shoot from the hip. I just go like this, and I just tell you how it is. Don't be dumb. Don't be stupid. And I say that to everyone in here, you know, including, you know, the kids. Because sometimes kids, you know, they'll hear testimonies, and they automatically assume, well, man, I didn't have that. I just grew up in church. I had to go through it. No, you don't. I believe the best testimony is, is for those that have been born and raised in church and have continued to follow the Lord and say, I don't need the world. I don't need to find out what the world's got going on because God's got it going on. Right? And, you know, Saul's experience you know, certainly was dramatic, but like I said, it's not normal. It wasn't a normal thing. You don't see that happen to every single person in the Bible. God spoke, uh, God spoke to, you know, to, to Saul... This is King Saul. I want, I want to let you know. King Saul, he, God, I'm sorry, God doesn't you know, speak to us all the time like in an earthquake or a big you know, flash and everything else. But more often than not, he speaks to us in a still small voice. He, sp he speaks to us in a still small voice. And the reason why we don't like that is because we like to have a whole lot of commotion going on. I think that's, you know, that this generation has to be one of the most distracted generations I've ever seen. You say, well, Pastor, you're only 46. Well, in my 46 years, it is the most distracted I've ever seen. Children are not allowed to be bored nowadays. But there's been, you know, times, you know, uh, where, like, my daughter but other kids, you know, come up and say, I'm bored. I'm say, awesome. Go be bored. And she's like, no, no, no. My daughter will sit there and say, no, I got to have something. I got to, you know, no, be bored. It's okay. They don't have to have a phone. They don't have to have, have, be constantly watching something on YouTube 24-7. They don't. I mean, think about it. Like, I think about, like, you know, way back when I was a kid, you know, almost a half century ago. Man, it's a long time ago. And I was bored. But that's where I came up with a lot of, you know, stuff and, and a lot of thoughts in my mind about different things because I was bored. I didn't have something always constantly telling me, you know, like keeping me happy or, or sad or doing whatever. I didn't have like constant, you know, your music. I was out building forts. You know why I started building forts? Because I was bored. And then I had some ingenuity. Sometimes that ingenuity worked and sometimes it didn't. There's a reason why tech companies have their kids you know, with only 30 minutes, 30 minutes of screen time a day. You say, my child will never make it with 30 days. Let me be honest with you. You've allowed it to get to that point to where it's more than 30 minutes a day. But they only allow them 30 minutes a day. Why? Because they know that there is something amazing in boredom. That all ideas and stuff like that is somebody just sitting around, you know, sitting you know, next to a tree on the grass one day, just it's a little cold today, you know, to do that now, but, and just looking up at the clouds, looking up at, you know, at a starry night. And then, you know what? And they're beginning to ponder and beginning to think. They're actually using their imagination. <gasps> we can't do have that. We can't have kids using their imagination. They might think for themselves. We can't have that, right? But that's the problem with kids nowadays is they're taught 
whatever is put in front of them, whatever is on that screen, that's what you, you, know, that's what you believe. They're not taught to think for themselves anymore. They're not on tests. They will be asked their opinion, and if the opinion doesn't go with the teacher, then they will get that question wrong. How do you get your opinion wrong? It's your opinion. It's your thought that you have. They're being taught nowadays, to you, you think the way we want you to think, and that's the way we want you to think. Don't, don't go out outside of that. And we've, we've, I believe in the past couple of weeks, we've heard of a cult that does that, and there's many cults that do that, which is they don't want you to think for yourselves. It's whatever they tell you. And that cult we, you talked about is the Jehovah's Witness. But I would go on there and say the same thing as far as in, you know, in government or anything else. They want you to believe whatever they have you to believe, and they don't want you to like read. I mean, how many times have you heard somebody you know, try to burn or, or, or want you to like burn certain books? That's what happened like with you know, you know, the books like say, 1984 and all that other kind of stuff is because that would get people to think, and they wanted to burn those books. You know who else did that? You know who, else, who, who burned books? Nazi Germany. So when the government starts telling you to do that, you might as well just say, you know, you might as well just, you know, a pledge your allegiance to Hitler because it's about the same thing. Think for yourselves. That was a rabbit trail. I'm going to come back on it over here. First Kings chapter 19, verses 11 and 12. It talks about the fact of God coming in a still small voice. And it says, And he said, go forth and stand upon the mount before the Lord. And behold, the Lord passed by. And a great and strong wind rent the mountains and break in uh, in pieces the rocks before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, an earthquake. But the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after uh, the earthquake, a fire. But the Lord was not in the fire. And after a fire, a still, small voice. That's how God comes. Let your kids, let yourself be bored. There's often times where, you know, I've come into a place and I've asked people, I said, you know, are you actually watching the TV right now? Like, oh, no, I just need some some stuff going on in the background. You know what that also does? Because some people say, well, I don't want to hear stuff come outside. I want to hear an intruder. Do you know what that does? That gives, you know, the, uh, the intruder some, you know, some noise and everything else to sneak up on you, by the way. But... It's also the fact, you know what, let your mind, okay, if you get one thing out of this, just go home and be bored. Because it's going to help you out in the long run. Just be bored. Number five is this, God only reveals his will to the young. How many times have you, know, have you gotten that myth is that God only talks to, the, uh, to young people. He doesn't talk to you know, middle age or older people. I mean, that's just you know, for the young kids. Well, I got saved and uh, I got saved when I was almost 21. I didn't get called into preaching until I was 22, 23. So, man, I must have missed the boat on that one. And some of you say, well, you know, pastor, I'm 50, 60, 70 years. God still has a plan for you. He still has his will for you. God calls people of all ages. He never stops using his saints. If God, was, uh, if God were finished with you, he would have called you home. That's how you know, you know uh, when God's will is done for your life is when you're in glory. Is when you're in heaven with him. If you are, you know, if you're sitting on the sidelines, I can guarantee you that you need to seek his will. It is never too late to do the will of God. It is never too late to do the will of God. You say, well, Pastor, I don't know about you know doing I'm not saying that the will of God is is like working here at the church or doing something because some of you well, all the all the positions at church are taken. Well, for one thing, that's a myth. Because I can guarantee that if you came and hey, said, hey, pastor, can, you know what, I, I just, could I do this, blah, 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 and I'm not going to be like, no, it's already taken, go away. I mean, I think about Doc. Doc came up to me and says, you know what, the Lord has been speaking to me about teaching a class. And I said, all right, when do you want to do it? Next week. And I said, okay. And I put him in, in, in connection with somebody else because, you know what, I believe that God wants us to, you know, to have that going on. And you say, well, I can never teach. I can guarantee that Doc said, he probably was thinking in his mind, I can never teach. But he's been doing it for the past, uh, you know, uh, almost two months now. And from what I understand in here, you know, they say he's been doing a great job. 
Sorry, Doc. I didn't mean to call you out, but I did. Number six is this. This is the sixth myth and final myth that I have on here is God's will is hidden from us and we have to find it ourselves. Think about what I read just a little bit earlier in Luke chapter 11. The pure absurdity of, the, of a father hiding his will for his son. I mean, or the fact of just hiding your, what you want your child to do. Like, that would be like me sitting there trying to tell my daughter, you know, to go, I don't know, like go pick up something but not saying a word. And then getting mad at her when she doesn't do it. Okay, this is, you know, this ain't Star Wars or something like that. You could use the force. We can just go with that and somehow it just transfers to her brain. I reveal my will by what? Talking to her. The same way for her. If I, if I want her to do something, I ask her to do, you know, something, right? And I don't get mad when I, you know, when it's like, well, you, okay, and this may be something that's a little bit outside of the thing, but ladies, this is a rabbit trail. Ladies, if you want your husband to do something for you. Tell them they can't read your mind. I've been married 16 and a half years. So you'll be 17 in July. I still can't read her mind. I, I can't do it. I'm like, if you want me to do it, just say it. Okay, back off the rabbit trail. All right. Now that we've gone through you know, some of those myths concerning God's will, I want to share some steps into leading us to know God's will. Number one is this, that God's guidance is provisional. In other words, you know, what I'm saying here is God expects certain things from us. Unless we are able to deliver these characteristics, we will probably remain in the dark concerning his will. In other words, God wants us to you know, have, do certain things or, you know, uh, in order for him to show his will. Number one is being will to, uh, willing to obey him. You say, well, why do I got to do that? Isn't that what Paul did? God told him, he says, go into the city. If Paul doesn't go into the city, does he know his life? To, you know, does he know, you know God's will for his life? I mean, it's going to be a very short story. There'll be a very short account in the Bible if Paul goes, yeah, about going into the city, I got something else to do. But it's being willing to obey uh, being willing to obey him. Too often, we make our plans, set them in motion, and then, and then call God in to bless them. Right? We go out there and go, I got to do this, I got this, and this. Oh, yeah, by the way, Lord, I just pray that you would just bless those if you would. To generally do his will, we must put our will aside and be willing to do all that he asks us to do. I mean, think about it. There's times where... We've been in the store, like the grocery store, and God was speaking to my daughter. My daughter will go, God, you know, said, you know, go talk to that person about Jesus. And we're like, and she's over there, she's like, do you know Jesus? She's a very blunt evangelist, I'll just tell you this. She'll go up and she's like, do you know Jesus? And, be, you know, somebody's like, no, I'm like, why not? I mean, just, just very, you know, whatever. And we're sitting there going, okay. It's about time to go, you know, and everything else and whatever. And she'll have him over there, and she's like, well, you should. And, whatever. and she starts, starts talking to him about the Lord, and we're like, okay, you just we'll be a couple minutes late to whatever we have going. Just go ahead and whatever. And she'll talk to me, you know, she'll go ahead and do it. I say that because I want, you know, kids to realize that God's will is for everybody. It's not just for a select few. It's not for the old, you know, when you get to a certain age. Can you honestly say, you know, Lord, wherever... Wherever you lead, I'll go. Can you, ever, can you honestly say that? Wherever you lead, I'll go. Some people don't like that because they're like, oh, wait, God's going to call me to like Africa. I'm going to be in a hut, you know, over there. I'm not going to have any phone, cell phone service. I'm not going to whatever. God calls some, you know, to that. He doesn't call everyone to that. Why, uh, why should God reveal his will to us when he knows that we aren't going to do it anyway? I want to uh, flip over to uh, Isaiah chapter uh, 58. Isaiah 58. Isaiah 58, verse 11. The Bible, uh, the Bible reads, 
and the Lord uh, and the Lord shall guide thee continually and satisfy thy soul in drought, and uh, make the uh, and make fat thy bones, and thou shalt uh, be like a water garden, and like a, a spring of water whose waters fail not. In other words, wherever God guides, He will provide. That's what he's. That's what he's saying. He says, uh, "And the, the Lord shall guide thee continually." Wherever God guides you, He's going to provide for you. I said God's guidance is prov- uh, is provisional, but we must also display a spirit of meekness. That is to be teachable and humble. Flip over to I. Uh, flip over to uh, Psalm twenty-five. Psalm 25. I, the reason why I'm going through these is because I want you to begin to see what God you know, has for you. Psalm, verse, Psalm 25, verse 9 says, The meek uh, will he guide in judgment, and the meek will he teach his way. That's a promise. He's saying that if you're, te- uh, if you're teachable and you're humble, what is he going to do? He says he's going to guide you in judgment, and he's also going to what? Teach you his way. God's going to show you these things when you do that. When you sit there and you display that teachable spirit, because what, what, what did uh, Paul say? He says, what would you have me to do? And he says, go into the city. You have to be teachable. You have to be willing to sit there. You can't sit there and argue with every single person that comes along, especially you know, a believer that's trying to help you. If you aren't teachable and think that you already know everything, then you'll probably never know the will of God. If you think that you, you're, a know, if you're a know-it-all and you think you got everything already taken care of, you're not going to be able to learn anything. Even when somebody tries to teach you out of, you know, saying, hey, this is what I found. I've met people that, you know, were saved, you know, for like a month and started telling the person that was saved, you know, for like 50 years that they didn't know what they were talking about. I'm not saying that everybody that's been saved for 50 years is right. I'm saying the fact is that you need to have a teachable spirit. You need to be humble in that as well. You also need to be be open to God. Earnestly, uh, uh, sincerely praying for guidance and report for duty. When, when you, uh, you earnestly pray for God's guidance, and, and what I mean by, by uh, report for duty is like, I'm ready to go. Don't wait to be drafted. Just show up and ask him if he has an assignment for you. That day, you say, you know what, Lord, I want to do your will. What is it? And sometimes God's not going to, you know, most of, uh, sorry, most of the time, God's not going to give you an audible voice. But all of a sudden, you're going to be right in the middle of what God would have you to do that day. If you're... Uh, if you're open to God and what he would have for you, if God uh, isn't, showing, uh, isn't showing you uh, anything, perhaps also you should examine your life to see how much time you really spend with him in private. Too often he is speaking, but no one is listening. The reason why I say that is because when we have all these things going on in life and we give little attention to God's word, give a little attention to, to worship, give a little attention to prayer, give a little attention to that, God can't hear, uh, you can't hear God because you have all the distractions going on. If you want to hear from God, you've got to hear his voice from his word. We also need to be yielded to God. We need to be yielded to God. Verses 8 and 9 of, chapter, uh, of, of Acts chapter uh, 9, it says this, And Saul arose from the earth, and when his eyes were opened, he saw no man. But they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. And he was three days without sight, neither did he eat nor drink. As soon as he had a word from, uh, uh, had a word from God, he got uh, busy doing it. Again, God probably won't reveal, uh, reveal his will to someone who isn't going to do it anyways. That goes back to the whole fact of willing to obey him. If God reveals it, you need to be willing to obey it. I've met many of people that, that said they're called to be missionaries, and where are they at? They're like where they grew up at. Because why? Because they refused to go where God was calling them. I know of one in particular who was called to Libya, and he goes, but his wife did not want to. She's like, I'm not called to be a missionary. I don't want to be a missionary. This was before they were married. So he knew where to go. He knew where God had called him to go, but you know what? He liked this girl and said, you know what? I'm going to go ahead and marry her. And to this day, he's not doing what God's called him to do. 
and he's miserable. But if you bring up the fact, be like, you know what? You said that you were called here. Yeah, but she didn't want to go. Be careful who you marry. If you're single, be careful who you marry. Because if they don't have the same calling, it's not going to be a good, you know, it's not going to be a good situation. If all the areas of your life are yielded and open uh, to his will, then you can expect that God will reveal himself to you. Are you willing to do his will regardless of how much it costs you? For some, and say, that's the thing. I like to do God's will, but as long as it doesn't cost me much. Or as long as I can do whatever I still want to do. Number two is this. God's guidance is practical. God's guidance is practical. God will reveal his will in ways that will be plain to see and to understand. He used several in the Bible. There are still, and these are still many of his ways. God's going to make it plain and simple, but we want to make it some big grand gesture of what's going to go on. And I want to let you know, actually, uh, you know, I'll be, do- I'll be done in, in the next 10 minutes. God will reveal his will in ways that are plain to see and to understand. One way is through miracles. We see this with Saul slash Paul. Normally, God won't speak to a man like the way that he did uh, to Saul, but the, you know, and this was a miracle, but occasionally he will speak in this way, but don't wait on it because you, but don't wait on it you know, before you, uh, you go ahead and you, you begin to serve. Begin to, you know, begin to serve, begin to do those things that, you know, at church, begin to serve people, begin to do all those things while you're waiting for God maybe to show you that. Because the thing is, is that if you're not, you know, willing to serve, you're just sitting there waiting the entire time, you're not being any good. The next way that he will, uh, that he will reveal his will is through his word. Through his word. God's word holds the answers to all of life's questions. All of life's questions. Turn over to uh, Psalm 119. Psalm 119. You say, well, where is that at? If you have your Bible, probably just open it up like this, and probably you'll en- end up in Psalms and then be able to go uh, and find it. Usually Psalm 119 is about right in the middle of your Bible. Psalm 119, verse 89. Why should we trust his word? Because of what it says in Psalm 119, verse 89, it says, Forever, O Lord, thy word is settled in heaven. Does it change? No. God's word does not change. God's word does not change. Matthew uh, chapter 5, verse uh, 18. Matthew chapter 5, verse 18. For verily I say unto you, uh, till heaven and earth pass, not or it, one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law till all things be fulfilled. The Bible says that one jot, one tittle. Now one thing is why. Because everything has to be fulfilled. He says heaven and earth shall pass away, but you know what? His word will not pass away. The third way that God, uh, that God reveals himself reveals his will for you is through his people through his people we see that you know if you read the rest of the story in verses 8 through 20 i'm not gonna for time's sake i'm not gonna read 8 through 20 but if you read uh, those verses god uses ananias to speak his will to saul never count the uh, never uh, discount the uh, the counsel of godly people around you if there are godly people around you ask them they oftentimes see things that you don't normally see in you. Flip over to Proverbs chapter, uh, chapter 24. Proverbs chapter 24, verse 6 says this, For by wise counsel thou shalt make, uh, make thy war, and in a multitude of counselors there is safety. And in a multitude of counselors there is safety. God is saying, you know what? If you ask a lot of you know a lot of people, a lot of believers around you, 
You know what, there's safety in that. Why? Because you're getting different people's perspective. And if all those people are saying the same thing, then you know, hey, this is God's will for my life. But also, don't take what they say. Always go back to God's word. Everything is always go back to God's word, no matter what. Even if it seems like there's a miracle that happens, go back to God's word. Always go back to God's word. We also you know, need to stay away from the, you know, the danger of pride because it will cause us not to listen. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 12 says, Wherefore, let them that thinketh he standeth take heed lest he fall. In other words, pride goes before the fall. Don't let your pride you know, block God's will for your life. The last one is this. God will, uh, God will let you know his will through his spirit. Through his spirit. Verse 17 of uh, Acts chapter 9 says this. And Ananias uh, went his way and entered in, uh, into the house, and putting his hands on him, uh, said, Brother Saul, the Lord, even uh, Jesus, that uh, appeared unto, uh, unto thee in the way as thou camest, uh, hath sent me, that thou mightest receive thy sight and be filled with the Holy Ghost. If he doesn't go there, he's always blind. If he doesn't follow what God's will is you know, for him, for one thing, Ananias never lays his hands upon him, and he never receives his sight back. But the other thing is, is that he, he's never told what Ananias knows that the Lord has told him. Here's the thing. The Holy Spirit is in us, and he will guide us into all truth. One of the distinguishing marks of God's sheep is their earmark. God knows his sheep, and his sheep know him. But we have to be willing to listen to him, to obey him, to follow him. God speaks through, uh, uh, to people through the Holy Ghost. But also make sure that if you're sitting there saying, Lord, I'm listening, you know and, uh, and you are aware. Beware of listening to you know, just random voices. Beware of listening to, you know, to, to voices. Because there's a, you know, the devil's going to go around and try and you know, stop all this, right? The devil's not going to want you to know God's will for your life. He doesn't want you to do that. So God has, we know that God has a big plan for your life. Do you know what it is? Do you know what God's will is? If not, be meek, teachable, humble, open, and yielded to God. Listen for his leading voice and his word, his people, and his spirit. And he will reveal his will, his will unto you. God wants you to know his will for your life. He doesn't want it. It's not a mystery. He wants you to know what it is. If you know his will, are you doing it? Did God speak to you years ago about his will, and now you're not doing it? Why? Because you let something else take over. He said, you know what? I don't want to do that. That scares me, or whatever it is. Or I'm not going to do that because I have my own plans. If not... If you're not doing that, there is no time like the present to surrender and to yield to the will of God. Here's the thing, is that just because you ignored it before does not mean you have to ignore it today. You can go back to the Lord and ask him you know, for the will of God for your life. More than likely, it's going to be the same exact thing that he called you to do before. As I said before, where he guides he provides where he guides he provides whatever he tells you to do wherever he guides you wherever he leads you wherever he takes you he's going to provide the way for you i think about you know when we first came here actually when we were you know when we were uh, trying out we're checking out the church and everything else to be honest there was a lot of questions we're like lord i mean we felt good about being here but we're like lord you're gonna have to do some things that's all small stuff. One of the things for my wife, I remember, Lord, I know this is where you would have me to go, but they have tornadoes down that way. The Lord provided a tornado shelter at her house. So she's like, okay, Lord, no. amen. There's, there's different things. Where he, you know, where he, he guides you, he's going to provide for you. He's going he's to show you this is exactly where I have you to go. When we left... East Peoria, Illinois, as youth uh, pastors. There were people all around us, and this is why I say beware of of the voices you're listening to, because there were people all around us. I mean, 
believers, they loved the Lord, they loved us also. And they were like, I don't think that's of God. If you don't sell your house within the first week, it's not, the, not of the Lord. They had that. They flat out told us. They said, it's not of the Lord if you don't sell your house within you know, the first week. We sold our, our house, I believe, an hour and a half before it went on the market. And then they were like, okay. Well, then, yeah, probably is God's will, but I still don't like it. God knows where he guides, he will provide. Whatever he has you to do, he will provide. I'm not saying that it's going to be as easy as it was. Maybe, maybe God you know, called you back when you were single as a young adult, and now you're married and you have kids. It may be not as easy as it, it, it may have been back then because you're like, I got kids. I got a family. But where he guides, he provides. Where, God, you know, where he guides, he provides. So I want you, you know, for the next few moments, I want you to begin to, you know, ponder and think about those things and say, you know what, God, what is your will for my life? If you don't honestly know what it is, say, Lord, show me. And then you begin to be obedient. You begin to be open to the Lord. You begin to yield your life to him, and he will show you where he would have you to go. Over the next few moments, I just want you to begin to, you know, and I'm not saying, like, this is the end-all conversation. This is the end of it. But I'm saying, if you really want to know, let, uh, let God speak to you about where he would have you to go.